Well, good morning and welcome to Matins on this Monday of the 20th week after Pentecost. Thank you for being with me this morning. Uh, our scriptures for today are Psalm number five. We're starting a new book in the Old Testament. Um, so we'll be in Hosea chapter two. And uh, we'll continue where we left off on Saturday with Acts chapter 20. Now, um, the Sunday reading for Hosea was chapter one, and I would definitely encourage you, if you have not already, to go back and read chapter one, because it explains where we pick up today. So, <clears throat> all right, let's begin with the word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? Almighty God, you pour out on all who desire it the spirit of grace and supplication. Deliver us as we come into your presence from cold hearts and wandering thoughts, that with steady minds and burning zeal, we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. So, our psalm is number five. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning hear my voice, in the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness, evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes, you hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. For there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Because of the abundance of their transgressions, cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may exult in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. Let us pray. Holy Lord, all justice and all goodness come from you. You hate evil and abhor lies. Lead us in the path of justice, so that all who hope in you may, with the church, rejoice in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Our first reading is from Hosea chapter 2. Again, I encourage you, if you've not already, please go back and read chapter 1, because it sets the stage for what is happening in this chapter. 
This is the word of the Lord as brought to Hosea the prophet. And I'm going to start with verse 1, even though that was part of yesterday's reading. Say to your brothers, you are my people, and to your sisters, you have received mercy. Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife and I am not her husband, that she put away her whoring from her face, face and her adultery from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and make her as in the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness, and make her like a parched land, and kill her with thirst. Upon her children also I will have no mercy, because they are children of whoredom. For their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers, who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her, so that she cannot find her paths. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them, and she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Therefore, I will take back my grain in its time and my wine in its season, and I will take away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. And I will put an end to all her mirth, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her appointed feasts. And I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, of which she said, These are my wages, which my lover has given me. I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall devour them. And I will punish her for the feasts, feast days of the Baals, when she burned offerings to them, and adorned herself with her ring and jewelry, and went after her lovers and forgot me, declares the Lord. Therefore, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Accor a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so... That was a little bit um, rough, wasn't it? So let's go back. And I want I want to read to you, I want to share with you this introduction from, <clears throat> from this Bible. Okay. Again, read chapter one. <laughs> Hosea has been called the deathbed prophet of Israel because he was the last last to prophesy before the northern kingdom fell to Assyria, or about 722 BC, right? Remember. The kingdoms were split, north and south, the northern ten tribes and the southern two tribes had divided and had different kings. This was all part of the fallenness of the children of Israel and how they, some were righteous and some were not. And it led to div divided kingdoms, to cruel and evil kings. This is all part of God's wrath. Hosea's ministry followed a golden age in the northern kingdom with a peace and prosperity not seen since the days of Solomon. So there was a lot of that, okay? And Hosea came after that. Unfortunately, with this prosperity came moral decay. Hmm. And Israel forsook God to worship idols. So God instructed Hosea to marry a wife of whoredom. This is verse 2 of chapter 1. Her faithfulness to her husband would serve as an example of Israel's unfaithfulness to God. Okay, her unfaithfulness to her husband, sorry. Hosea then explained God's complaint against Israel and warned of the punishment that would come unless the people returned to the Lord and remained faithful to him. So the book shows the depth of God's love for his people, a love that tolerates no rivals. 
by the Lord your God, I'm a jealous God, right? All right, so this is the background to this whole prophet and everything that all of the word of God that he is called to bring to the people of Israel, okay? That's how this started. He is told to marry an unfaithful woman and make her his wife. A wife of whoredom is the word they use there. So please read that. So now starts chapter two. Say to your brothers, you are my people. And to your sisters, you have received mercy. All right. So what's going on here? Yeah, my people. Mercy. She has received mercy. Okay. So Hosea calls for his message to be heard by everyone in Israel, the whole nation, recalling not only a common lineage through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but especially God's constant blessing and favor. God has constantly shown these people mercy, even when they cheat on him with other gods. Remember, God has said, he is like the husband and the people are like the bride. And so when they pursue other gods, false gods, worship idols, it is like adultery. That is a common theme in the Old Testament, all right? God's promise, even before Israel promises to change, you are my people and you have received mercy. He made this promise. Um, there is some wordplay on the names of Hosea's children. Hosea's children are named Hebrew words that mean not my people and no mercy. How's that? Uh, Hosea artfully emphasizes God's promise to show mercy and to restore his people. It will come. They will feel his wrath, but his mercy will come. Plead with your mother. She's not my wife. I'm not her husband. Okay. This is a metaphor of Hosea's marriage and family life. Israel is identified as the Lord's unfaithful wife. This is talking about Israel now. Okay. Um. So this plead, this is more like in a court of law, not like, like a beggar would plead for um, money standing on the street corner. This is more like, like pleading for a judge to show mercy. Uh, because Israel has been guilty of adultery, as has Hosea's wife, whose name is Gomer, the nation has proven itself completely unworthy of a committed husband. However, the Lord does remain faithful. Interesting. He warns with increasing severity that if Israel refuses to repent, there will be, with increasing severity, shame, desertion, and death. This will be the punishment if they don't repent. The graphic imagery employed here recalls Israel's miserable status in Egypt and desperate conditions she experienced during the wilderness wanderings of Exodus, right? Wilderness, parched land, thirst. Trying to remind them what they were saved from by this God who they are cheating on. Uh, upon her children also, I will have no mercy, because they are the children of whoredom, right? Because the children are going to do the same thing. The children are also, gonna, they're not being brought to God, so they're going to be exposed to these false gods, and it doesn't matter. They will, they will face the same punishment. Although they are earnestly invited to a restored relationship in verse 1, right? All right, you are my people, you have received mercy. They are invited to that. God's children will yet be left without mercy if they continue in their rebellion. Just as husbands typically feel little obligation for children who are conceived in adultery, the Lord also warns the tainted children of Israel that he may desert them if they are not faithful. So, all right. Israel acts like Everything that God has been giving them, 
that they deserve, right? But also as though it comes from the surrounding pagan nations. The people completely ignore God's generous provision. They've forgotten that it is God who makes the plants to grow and the animals to reproduce and the trees and the vines and all that they are able to use to su sustain themselves ultimately comes from God. Oh, well, that just, that was the land of milk and honey. Yeah. Who do you think provided the milk and provided the honey? They're completely ungrateful. So, therefore, I will hedge up her way with thorns. Wow. Before acting on his threat to kill Israel, the Lord is going to act to restrain her wickedness. By erecting a hedge, God means to block his people's pursuit of Baal. He's going to build up a wall against her so she cannot get to Baal. So she cannot cheat on her husband, the Lord. Israel sadly will end up frustrated within the protective maze of the restraining wall since she will persist in the pursuit of other gods. She's going to try, right? She will pursue them, but not, not overtake them, seek them, but not find them. All right. I guess I'll go back to my first husband. <laughs> He's going to make it so difficult for her that she will come back to him. That's the plan. So that he can be merciful to her and not kill her, right? Again, God is the husband. Israel is the bride. She did not know it was I, the Lord, who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished on her gold and silver, which ended up being used to worship a false god, Baal. Despite Israel's preposterous claims that her food and clothes came from other nations and other gods, the Lord here sets the record straight. He is the source of Israel's well-being. Ironically, Israel was taking the gold and silver God provided her and offered them to images of this false god, Baal. The people were even fashioning these precious metals into idols. All right. Now we get to verse 10. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers. This one's a little bit different. A return to the warning of verse 3, right? Lest I strip her naked and make her as in the day she was born. All right. Israel's nakedness contrasts with her boast that she is well supplied by other gods and other nations. So when God removes the fruitfulness of the land, the fertility god Baal will be useless to cover Israel. That's when, when the true God takes it away, they will discover exactly who it came from because Baal will not be able to provide anything being a false God. <clears throat> all right. So all these feasts and things, those are going to come to an end. Annual celebrations of Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Booths. The New Moon celebrations were monthly. The Sabbath, of course, is every week. Weekly, monthly, and annual celebrations will come to an abrupt halt when God allows a pagan invader, the Assyrians, to come to an end, er, uh, to take Israel into exile. The Assyrians are soon to capture them and take them away. They will lose all ability to celebrate. Okay? And when that happens, all, all the crops will be laid waste. Those crops that she said, these are my wages, which my lovers have given me. Right? She thinks it comes from other gods and other nations. Ooh, not good. So... Um, they, they foolishly considered the fertility of the land to be the result of their illicit relationship with Baal. Accordingly, God threatens to overthrow this folly by laying waste to the vines and the fig trees. And a forest, remember, for people of this time, a forest was a dangerous place. 
not a good place to be. It was, it had all kinds of violent beasts in it that were dangerous. Okay. You didn't want to be in a forest. And the beasts of the field shall devour them. Everything they had will be gone. All right. And I will punish her for the feast days of the Baals. All right. Um, Israel abandoned the Lord's festivals, which we just talked about, and began offering sacrifices to Baal. And the abundance of individual shrines to Baal likely explains, explains the plural Baals and multiple shrines. Okay. Uh, where she burned offerings to them. Numerous places in the Old Testament refer to Israel offering burnt sacrifices to Baal and Asherah. Asherah was the female goddess that went with Baal. Adorned herself with ring and jewelry. Israel continues to act as a harlot, dressing in finery to attract attention, pursuing Baal instead of her faithful Lord. Yeah. So... <laughs> All right. So now God is going to have mercy. We're finished today with verse 15. So let's let me just pull that up. Okay. Therefore, behold, I will allure her. What is God doing here? This is like persuade or entice is another way. God turns from threatening Israel to pursuing her winsomely. He wants to win her back. He wants her heart. The word wilderness recalls the Exodus and a time when Baal had not intruded into the relationship between God and Israel. I'll speak tenderly to her. He speaks with the kindness of a loving spouse. And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Akor a door of hope. All right. A core means trouble. <laughs> All right, what's going on here? This is southwest of Jericho. God judged Israel here during the entry into the promised land, Joshua chapter 7. And since a core means trouble, God ironically reverses the name of the valley by calling it a door of hope. This move follows the transformation of Hosea's children's names, right? No mercy. Um, what was the other one? Oh, shoot. Yeah, not my people and no mercy are his children's names. So he's turning that around. It anticipates the reversal of the way Israel will address the Lord in verse 16. My husband. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, and then finally, there she shall answer as in the days of her youth. This recalls Israel's acts of faithfulness when she rejoiced to follow the Lord out of Israel and worshiped him after entering Canaan. All right. So this is a different book. This is different than um, some of the other prophets we've read. Um, and I'm still wrapping my head around God commanded Hosea to take an unfaithful wife. Think about that. Wow. And he's using that to illustrate to his people what they're doing by worshiping these other gods, not taking their relationship with the God who delivered them from oppression and who will ultimately deliver them from eternal oppression. And they're treating him like a boring husband and chasing after somebody who's sexier. Hmm. And we, let's see, yep, we will pick up right there with verse 16 tomorrow. Okay, let's do Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> now from Miletus, he, that is Paul, sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How did I not shrink from declaring to you, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, and teaching you in public from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God 
and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all, and there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again, and they accompanied him to the ship. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, so <laughs> this is how we finished on Saturday talking about Paul's travels. He, he went to a couple different places and ended up in, in Miletus, right? He wasn't going to go to Ephesus. He didn't want to get stuck in Asia. He wanted to get to Jerusalem by, by the day of Pentecost. He had a strong call to be there, but he sent to Ephesus and asked them to come to him, right? And they did. So he's giving them a farewell speech here. All right, so the elders, these are the pastors, okay? Now, let me show you this word here, elders. Presbuteros, right? Can you hear it? Presbyter, elder, presbyter, okay? And keep that in mind, presbyter. These are the pastors of those churches in, in Ephesus. Um. He had appointed by the authority of the Holy Spirit. He ordained them as pastors. He taught them. He appointed the leaders. He ordained them. All right. All of you know, I lived with you. And that whole time, from the very first day I set foot, serving the Lord with humility and tears and trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. Right? He was humble. And he did. It wasn't all joy. And there were bad things because the Jews worked against him. They imprisoned him. They beat him. They tried to have him killed. Right? This is the only address recorded in all of the book of Acts that Paul makes to a Christian audience. He recalls the work he did among the Ephesians and then speaks of the imprisonment and afflictions awaiting him in the future. Hmm. That's coming, right? I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, you know, bound in the Spirit. The Spirit's, he is being called by the Spirit and he can't say no. He doesn't know what, I don't know what will happen to me there, but the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. Everywhere he goes, that has happened. And it's always been because of 
the Jews who do not. Well, I think there was one or two exceptions, but in most cases, it's the Jews. Well, Jerusalem is they that's where they crucified Christ. There are still those militant Jews there who refuse to hear this good news. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I did this with humility, he says, the true servant attitude he carries out how he carries out his apostolic ministry. Okay. Yeah. So this is how he describes that. Humility, tears, and trials. All right. But that did not cause him to stop what he was doing. I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. Right? Meaning the good news. Even though the Jews didn't want him to, he didn't it didn't scare him. I taught in public, and I went house to house, and I taught every family, both Jews and Greeks. Repentance toward turning back to God and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, let's check this translation note. Okay, in our, all right. Now I'm going to Jerusalem because the Holy Spirit is calling me, and I can't say no. And everywhere I've been, the Spirit tells me, Imprisonment afflictions await me. I expect this to be the same. But, but, but I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. My life is not my own. If only I may finish my course and the ministry I received from Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. That is my purpose. And if my life is forfeit, but I finish my course and this is and this comes, I'm able to deliver this, then it will have been worth it. But all of you will never see my face again. I'm not coming home. I'm not coming back here, I guess I should say. So as far as you all, I'm innocent of the blood of everyone here. Right? If anyone does not come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, it's no longer on me. That's what Paul is saying here. Because I, I declare to you the whole counsel of God. You have what you need to be saved. Now, here's a caution. Ooh, okay, here is the caution. Hmm. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. All right, remember that elders word, presbyteros? Now let's look at overseers. See if you recognize this word. Darn it. Episcopos. Episcopos, like Episcopal, right? Episcopos. This is where we get the word. This is more like bishop. Okay. Episcopos. These words, we still use these words. They have meaning, right? Oh, my goodness. That took me way back. All right. Let's get back where we're supposed to be. All right. So. The Holy Spirit has, pay attention to yourselves and the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Jesus bought this church. He bought all these people with his own blood. I know after I leave, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. All right. People are going to come in and take advantage of your innocence, take advantage of your goodness. This is the same term used by Jesus to describe false teachers and their destructive nature. Do we have false teachers? Unfortunately, they are out there. Yes. The church, in the proper sense, has the Holy Spirit. Although wolves and wicked teachers run rampant in the church, they are not properly Christ's kingdom. That's from the Apology to the Augsburg Confession. So Paul, now graphically in verse 30, he describes, um, he contrasts his message of the whole counsel of God with that, with what the false teachers will proclaim malformed messages that will mislead the faithful. Look at there. From among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. 
So be alert, remembering for three years, I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. I was passionate about teaching you the truth for three years. So I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Right? Yeah. I've given you the truth. You have the correct teaching. You should be able to identify false teaching. Oh, by the way, I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. I did not try to get you to pay me. Right? You yourselves know with these hands, minister to my necessities and to those who are with me. He's a tent maker. He worked to support himself. These false teachers are going to come asking for gold and silver and riches. That's one way to identify them. If they are asking you, the church, to make them rich, then they are not following my Paul's example. I paid for myself, he says. And all these things I've shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. He's giving them multiple ways to identify the truth and true teaching, and proper teaching, and proper, complete counsel of God. And then he said these things, knelt down, and prayed with him. He prayed for, as, as he was departed. It says here, the usual, the usual posture for prayer in that time was to stand. Kneeling to pray was a posture that is assumed at times of great emotion. And they expressed the depth of their love for Paul with great emotion. They embraced and kissed him, being sorrowful, mostly that they would not see his face again, and they got him all the way to the ship. So, getting close to the end of Acts. What a, you know, this is about the best you can do as a teacher to tell everybody what to remember and to be careful and watch for the false teachings. Okay, I'm way over time. Let's complete our liturgy, shall we? In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty savior, born of the house of his servant, David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, the hand of your loving kindness powerfully, yet gently, guides all the moments of our day. Go before us in our pilgrimage of life. Anticipate our needs and prevent our falling. Send your spirit to unite us in faith, that sharing in your service, we may rejoice in your presence. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to skip ahead a bit because we're pushed for time. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now may the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. And that concludes our matins for today. Thank you for spending this time in the word with me. And thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day he has given to you. Uh, I hope you have a blessed Monday and that your week is off to a good start. 
And uh, we'll be back again tomorrow, but tomorrow night is Vespers. So 7 p.m. Um, yeah. Again, thank you for being here until we can be together again, whenever that is. May God bless and keep you. <laughs>